Just two. Thank you for that reading. Um, today's message is going to be from the book of Romans, chapter number 9. And uh, the title is simply, Is There Unrighteousness with God? And Abel's, Abel Wee has been asked to come for today's reading, so I'd like to ask Abel to please come forward. Uh, Good morning, church. Today I'll be reading from Romans 9, 1 to 18. Could you stand, please? I tell the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have a great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh who are Israelites, whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenant, the giving of law, the service of God, and the promises, of whom are the fathers, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. But is also not the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel, who are Israel, nor are they all children, for they, or because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac, your seed shall be called, that is, those who are the children of the flesh. These are not children of God, but the children of the promises are counted as seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time, I will come and Sarah will have a son. And not only this, but when Rebecca also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor have done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election may stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob, I have loved, but Esau I have hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to the Pharaoh, for this, is very, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he hardens. You may be seated. Thank you, Abel. Let's pray. Father, Lord, thank you for your word once again to us. Your word is powerful. Your word is life. It is living. Lord, it is It is uh, the power to change a person's heart and soul. So, Lord, I pray that your spirit would take the word of God, administer it to us, change us. Father, if there is anyone who is unsure of their own salvation, their own relationship with you, I pray that you would lovingly convict him and draw him to Jesus the Savior. Lord, help us as believers to have a greater understanding of you, who you are, of your dealing with mankind, of your dealing with uh, the nation of Israel, as well as with us, your people. Lord, just strengthen us through the word, I pray in Jesus' name. And we say, amen, amen. To some here at Chapter 9, it may seem like Paul is suddenly veering off on a different topic altogether. We just finished the chapter 8 last week. Uh, By the way, Jen and I were away in Napier, as I'm sure many are aware of. I appreciate Pastor Mike for uh, continuing the the series here. We just finished up chapter 8, where Paul discusses the security of the believer and and, uh, how he... uh, then goes into chapter 9 here, and we see that the people 
Just Paul's heart is changed a bit as he thinks of his own people. These were people that were chosen by God for a particular purpose, God's reason. And now you tell us that they're set aside, Paul, that Paul is building his church now. And to some, Paul might have been seen as a traitor to his own people, ministering to the Gentiles and teaching a, a freedom from the law. We're no longer under law, but under grace. And so you can see perhaps how his own people might feel about the Apostle Paul and what he is teaching to them. Let's first see, number one, Paul's sorrow for blessed Israel. Paul's sorrow for blessed Israel. As he thinks of his own people, as he thinks of the lost people of his own Israel, we see Paul's heart. He weeps for them. Let's take a look. Notice again. He says, I tell you the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bear me witness in this Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. Why, Paul? For I could wish that I myself were accursed for Christ, for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. That is, a, my own people, according to where I, and how I was born. I'm an Israelite myself. And my heart is breaking for them. What he is saying here is I wish he would be willing to be cursed by God if doing so would mean that his own people would come to faith in Christ the Messiah and be saved. That's what he was saying. I'd be willing to be cursed myself from God, to be cut off from God, if it would mean that. There was a similar fellow in the Old Testament, a good man of God, who had the same heart for his own people. This prayer was similar to one that Moses prayed in the book of Exodus. After the people had committed the sin of building the golden calf, if you recall, in uh, uh, Exodus uh, chapter 32, in verse 31, Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, these people have committed a great sin and have made themselves a God of gold. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray, blot me out of your book which you have written. Moses is essentially saying the same thing. God, forgive them, but if you, if you can't, then do it if you have to blot me out of your book. If you have to cast me aside, if you have to curse me instead. And so we see the same kind of heart in Moses as Paul has for his own people. Then he lists how blessed the people of Israel had been. He goes into some detail here. Verse 4, who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God forever. Amen. He talks about the many blessings that Israel, his own people, had been given over the many years. We see, first he mentions the adoption. Not in the sense that all born a Jew are saved, but that the entire generation, uh, not the entire generation, the entire nation of Israel as a whole were chosen by God to be his holy people. To be the nation that he was going to work his plan through. God chose them. Why? We're going to go more into detail of that in a little bit. But it wasn't because they were just so amazing or so much more special than anybody else. But God chose them. We see the glory. Whether God through the pillar of fire or the presence of God in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. And then later in the temple. God chose this people through which he would reveal and show his glory among mankind. We see the covenants. These are God's legally binding promises that he made through the people of Israel, beginning with Abraham. When he said, Abraham, I am going to do this for you. I'm going to make you a great nation. 
All people of the earth will be blessed through you, through this nation. We see the law itself was given uh, through Israel. When God gave his law, it was through them. We see the service of God. Still in verse 4, the service of God. This is the priestly order. They were the ones that were designated to uh, worship God through the temple, through the sacrificial system that God had established, the priestly order. They were also the ones, according to the flesh, through whom Christ came, the Messiah, the eternally blessed God. But the point that Paul is making is in spite of all this, the many blessings that have come their way from God, the, when the Messiah came, they failed. They didn't receive him. As a whole, they rejected him. Paul was talking of his own people here. And you can see his heart and how broken he is for them. Even willing to say, God, if, if, I, if I could, I would be accursed so that they could be saved. He wanted his people to come to the same salvation faith that he graciously did when he was called by God. All I want you to do at this stage is ask yourself a question. Do you have a longing for your people? Do you have a longing for your people that they would come to know Christ as well? Do you have that same kind of passion to say, God, I'd be willing to be cursed if my people could come to salvation through Christ? Do you care about those, your family, your own people, your own country? Do you care about those people that they don't know the Lord as well? We need this kind of heart that Paul had. Paul loved the Lord. God graciously saved Paul. But Paul's greatest desire was for his people to have the same salvation that he did. That's a challenge to us. The second thing we see is God's promises are not based on human achievements. This is important. The next part focuses on this. That when God makes promises, when God works and he chooses and as he chose and elected Israel to be the, the nation through whom he would give these many blessings and through whom his salvation promises would come, it's not based on human achievements. Paul explains the basis of God choosing Israel. First of all, we see, A, it was not of natural descent. What he is essentially saying in the next few verses is that there's a difference between the natural seed of Abraham and the spiritual children of Abraham. He says in verse 6, it is not the, uh, that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children because they are of the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac, your seed shall be blessed. When it says they are not all Israel who are of Israel, it means that just because one is born there doesn't mean that they are Israel spiritually by faith. And today, for example, as a whole, it's a very secular, uh, unbelieving uh, people. And so just being born in the right uh, geographical location doesn't mean that salvation is just automatically given. They must come to faith in the Messiah, in Jesus Christ, like all of us who are a new creation, all of us who are new people, all of us who are this chosen generation, a holy people unto God. They must also come to faith in the same Savior. The reason he says, but in Isaac, your seed shall be called, is because Isaac wasn't the firstborn son of Abraham, was he? Who was the firstborn son of Abraham? Abraham had another. His name was Ishmael. Abraham had another son whom, according to the flesh, should be, have, have been selected the son of promise, the one through whom the promises that God had given would come because he was the oldest and the firstborn to Abraham. 
That was the natural, normal way of the time. But God had chosen something else, hadn't He? God had chosen something else. Verse 8, that is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. God had made a promise. And even though Abraham and Sarah had tried in the flesh to help God fulfill his promise, God had a a promise that he was going to fulfill in his way, in his time. And that is why God said, no, it's not going to be Ishmael. There's another promise. There is my promise that I will fulfill. Now get this. Paul is again using terms he's often used. Talking about the flesh and the spiritual. The flesh and the carnal. There is the, the physical, the, the, physical the, the, the fleshly, the carnal, the carnally minded. And then there is the spiritual. God's people have always been a spiritual people. A spiritual people. Not a people according to the flesh. The one God chose to use and to bless was to be the son of promise through Sarah. This was his doing. This was the son of promise. Not the son according to the flesh, which would have been logically Ishmael. So just a quick application in your, your, to your own self and your background. Your background, your heritage, your family. These things does not matter when it comes to our relationship with God. It, when I say that, it does matter in that it can be a blessing. Much like Israel had many blessings that were given to them from God. And growing up, perhaps, in a Christian home might have had its blessings in that you've learned more about God. But each person, each person must become a child of God spiritually. Spiritually. You are either going to attempt to in the flesh, or you will spiritually be born again. You will either be a fleshly man or a spiritual man. Each person must come to God when convicted by the Spirit of God and trust and repent. So we see, first of all, this uh, choosing, this election of Israel was not by natural descent. Secondly, it was not by human merit. He goes on to uh, give the example of Rebekah's two sons. Who were Rebekah's two sons? Jacob and Esau. Verse 10, and not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand. Not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Essentially, God chose Jacob to be the one through whom the promises would continue, the promises would come. He chose Jacob even before the babies were born. That's why Paul says even before either did any good or any evil. That's not the point. God didn't look and choose them based on their performance. God didn't look and say, this one's not so bad. I think I'll pick uh, Jacob to be the one through whom the promises would come. Now, some people do get uh, focused on the statement, Esau, I have hated. Uh, Considering this context, when when this is said of God, it is not, uh, has nothing really to do with our, like, human emotions of love or hate. It's not an emotional thing. God, I just didn't like him. But rather, God chose one man and his descendants, and in so doing, was rejecting of the other and his descendants. God chose, for example, Abraham. God chose Abraham when he came to him and made that covenant 
the Abraham, I will make you a great nation, and, and all nations will be blessed because of you. The Messiah was going to come through Abraham. So the Bible could have said God loved Abraham but hated every other person. And in that context, we would understand what he is saying here. God chose to use Abraham in this special and unique way. Neither one had done good or evil. Showing God's choosing is not based on their character or conduct. In fact, as you read through Genesis, you can see, realize that Jacob didn't always have the best character, did he? He was tricky and it, through his deceit cheated his brother out of, uh, out of his father's blessing. He didn't even realize later when he got married. By the way, who did he marry? Jacob? Married? Starts with an R? Rachel. But who did he actually marry first? Oh, yeah. What a mess that was. And he didn't even realize it until later. How can you marry somebody and not realize it? I don't know. Yet the Bible talks of God blessing Jacob anyway. Because it was not based on Jacob's performance or merit. And how through him the people of Israel would, would bring in the Messiah. Clearly, this shows God's choosing to do his work through someone like Jacob was not because he saw something special in him and decided he's worthy of being used. In the same way, as I think of how God works, God didn't look down out of heaven one day and see Ken, Ken Young and says, you know, he's not so bad. I mean, I look around at other people in the room and, and he's a lot better than some of these guys. My goodness, have you seen John? Uh, I think I'll save Ken. He's a good fellow. No, there was no redeeming thing about my character in which God said he's worthy. I am saved by grace. You're saved by grace. That's it. None of us can point to something in our life and say, oh, that makes sense. That's why I'm saved. That's why I'm a Christian. Because I'm not such a bad guy. No, I realize, I have acknowledged, if I got what I earned, what I truly deserved, then I would be in trouble. I would be doomed. I don't deserve God's kindness and grace and mercy. But next we see not only... Was it not based on human merit, but it was not based on human will. And now in verse 14, Paul raises yet another objection that someone might have since God chose someone over another one. Since God chose um, Jacob instead of uh, Esau. He says, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Again, he says, certainly not. We've seen this kind of objection over the chapters as we've been going through the book. You know, uh, shall we continue in sin? No, of course not. And he says the same thing here. Certainly not. As we just examined, God's choosing was not based on human merit. God can show mercy to whomever he wishes. But we have to realize uh, no one is righteous. None of us are deserving. And the fact that God has chosen some things and God has chosen to use some people in this way, in this manner, it does not mean in any way God is unrighteous. Paul gives another example in the Old Testament in verse 15. So the first example that he, he gave, of course, was uh, with Isaac. And then he gave the example of Jacob. And now he gives another example here of, Mo, of Moses and Pharaoh. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. 
So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For that the scripture says to the Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Again, as Paul has already declared, and we must reiterate it, Paul makes clear that no one, no one deserves God's compassion or mercy. It's not about deserving or not deserving. And he brings up here the example of Pharaoh in the Bible during Moses' time. And before he does, he makes this statement, So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. The him who wills has to do with our human will. It's not about me uh, willing something to be so. Willing that I have God's compassion and mercy. Willing that God would uh, show me favor. Or of him who runs. In regard to running, it's uh, working for something. Uh, striving for it. It's not about human will. Human work. And then Paul says of Pharaoh that even through his stubborn unbelief, God's name is declared in all the earth. God used Pharaoh in his stubbornness and unbelief to show his great power and brought him glory. How? Over and over again, we see in, in the story of Moses and the Pharaoh at the time, over and over again, Pharaoh hardened his heart to the things of God. And over and over again, God was the one that showed he ultimately was in control. God told Moses, go and tell him, Set, let my people go. And Moses would go and Pharaoh said, no way. And God showed his power over and over again. So as a Christian, I uh, must be humbled that God showed mercy to me. Not because I deserved it, for I didn't. Not because I earned it, for I have not. But he chose to show me mercy. I'm reminded of what John said in 1 John 4, 19. We love him because... He first loved us. Again, it's not that God saw me and he saw, wow, Ken really loves me. It doesn't mean that we waited until we saw that God loved us and then we decided, well, we'll return God's love. God loved me. Okay, I think I can love him back. No, our love for him is causative of his loving us. We have been made new. We're made a new creation. We love because God loved us first. We become his children. We are born again. We have changed families, family status. And now we can love because God is love and we are in him. That's what it means. We love him because he first loved us. It's because God was seeking me that I am able to love him, not only that, but able to love others. God is love, and I can love others because of him now. And finally, I want to close with this God's will be done. It says in verse 18, Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. So he's still finishing up with the idea of Pharaoh here. Pharaoh here. Using the example of Pharaoh, we can actually compare the two men and their outcome. Pharaoh and Moses. As we take a look at the men, we see both were sinners, correct? We even see both of them could be labeled murderers. Moses was guilty of physical murder himself. But yet we see Moses received God's mercy while Pharaoh receive God's punishment. And in both doing, both brought glory to God through this. Moses 
shows God's mercy and Pharaoh shows his judgment and his righteousness. And both in so doing was honoring and giving glory to God in it. To understand this verse more though, we need to compare it to other passages on this topic. This verse implies uh, God will to harden Pharaoh's heart. We also need to realize that we read in Exodus during the, the, the story, during the account of the Pharaoh. For example, Exodus 10 verse 1. Now the Lord said to Moses, go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine before him. So this verse says, Moses, I have hardened Pharaoh's heart, that I may show my glory through him, that I may show my signs and my power before everyone. And then, then in chapter 8, verse 15, but when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and did not heed them. The words of Moses. So we see both, and there's other passages too, but both of these, one says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. The other one says Pharaoh hardened his heart to God. So did Pharaoh harden his heart or did God harden his heart? And the answer to this must be, yes, he hardened his heart. Yes, God hardened his heart. As Paul asked in, in verse 14, though, is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. It is not God. We must remember, God doesn't cause people to commit sin. God didn't cause Pharaoh to be a sinner or to commit sin. Or else there would be unrighteousness with him. But Paul indicates that he chooses to show mercy on whom he will. Who does God will to show mercy on? I am reminded. Now this is where, and the, the truth is some of this stuff I will struggle with too. But I must be reminded of other passages where God talks about his will as well. And we come to passages like what Peter explains in 2 Peter 3, 9, where he says, The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So there's this aspect and understanding that God has a will for people to come to him. And the call of the gospel for all to repent is to all people. Not just to some, but to all. Was Pharaoh then ultimately responsible for his decision to disobey and harden his heart to God? And we'd have to say unequivocally, yes, he is responsible. Did God harden his heart? Yes, the scripture says this. Did Pharaoh harden his heart? Yes. Did God receive glory even through Pharaoh's actions? Yes. Yes. Did God receive glory through Moses and his actions and faithfulness and belief? Yes. We see God's mercy and compassion. We see God's justice and righteousness shown. God gets the glory in it. Is this difficult to fully understand? Again, I would affirm, say, yes, I definitely have a struggle to grasp it fully. And I take comfort in the fact that I don't always have to fully grasp all of God's working, all of God's knowledge and His understanding, because I cannot. I just have to believe it, believe what God says. And as the pastor, it's my responsibility to give the whole Word of God. So I do believe that God's calling to all is to repent and to believe in the gospel. That's God's calling to all. Do all repent. We know that. There's, we, we've had frustration in trying to share our faith with people at times only to have them say, nah, that's not for me, thank you. Or we would even say, man, it seems like their heart is being hardened. 
Is God's will therefore being thwarted? After all, God's willing that none should perish, but all come to repentance. No, God's will is not being thwarted. For even those in rebellion to God bring glory to God through His righteousness, through His righteous judgment. So the most important thing I want to have you ask yourself this morning is have you obeyed God's call to repent and to trust Him and to believe Him? Have you received God's mercy? Have you received His forgiveness? He does extend it out. The gospel call is to all. Not all are saved, but to all who believe, trust Him today and bring Him glory by being an example of how God saves sinners. Not through human merit, not through, uh, you know, where or who you're born to, not through... Um, Not through our will, but through His. Trust Him today and bring glory to God in showing how great His mercy is to sinners. I'd like to ask you to stand with me, please. In looking at God's choosing of Israel, or His election of Israel, to be the people through whom He come through whom the Messiah would come we have seen this morning Paul's heart for his own lost people Paul had a heart for all people who were lost but here he shows especially his own people his own countrymen as he's seen as a whole that they rejected the coming Messiah despite all the the uh, blessings that they had received Maybe some of you here have had many blessings in your life. Maybe. Maybe you've been a part of a good home. You've had been a, a, born into a, a very free country where you can come and hear of the Lord, or hear of God and His Word anytime. Maybe you've had influence of a family member, a close friend who has shared God with you many times. These are blessings. But no one becomes a part of God's family just through who they're born around, born into. You must come in faith. You must obey and repent, be born again. We've seen God's promises, though, are not through natural descent. They're not through achievement, human achievement. They're not through my own will, my own running, my own working. But it's through God. God's will be done. I urge you today, submit yourself to Him. Trust Him. Submit yourself to the Lord God. He is not willing for any to perish, but all come to repentance. Have you come to repentance? If you are unsure of your own salvation, as always, I urge you, come and talk to us. Let us know. Let us be able to sit with you and share the word more with you, to pray with you, to show you how you can be a new creation, be born again today. Come and talk to us after the service is over. Myself, Pastor Mike, Pastor Josh, Our leaders, our life group people, each would love to show you more of what it is to be a child of God, what it is to be born again. We're saved by grace through faith. That's it. None of us can boast or brag. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. Thank you for your salvation through the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And Lord, even though you came to your own people and they did not receive you. Some did. 
But Lord, we realize we're not saved by who the family or tribe or people group that we're born into. We're saved by faith. So Lord, I pray for anybody here who's unsure of their own salvation that, Lord, they would come to you in faith and trust you today. Thank you, Lord, that it's not about my will or my achievement, my status, but it's only by your mercy. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Would you please take a seat for a moment?